Good morning. The Lord be with you. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, it's a beautiful morning. Thank you to whoever turned the heat on in the sanctuary and got it all toasty for us this morning. We appreciate that. We have lots of announcements, so bear with me. First of all, the men's club is going to be meeting in a new location. It will be at the American Legion Post on College Drive in J-Town. Um, and next, the, next Saturday? Saturday? Yes, next Saturday. So if you have any questions, you can always talk to Don. The PW Thank Offering is today. There's envelopes in the pews, or you can just put your check in the offering plate and write on their PW Thanks Offering. There's a community Thanksgiving service on Tuesday. Information is in your announcements, and I believe there are going to be some car members maybe singing at that service, so that will be interesting. The it's the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Uh, poinsettias are being ordered now. You can email or call the church office. Or there won't be anybody sitting out in the lobby to take your order, so that's how we'll proceed with that. And more information is also in your bulletin. And if you haven't already returned your pledge card, we would appreciate doing so um, because we're trying to finalize the budget for next year. So that would be nice to have those back. We're glad to have everyone here this morning worshiping with us in person, our visitors, and those that may be watching us digitally. So if you would please stand with me and join me in the call to worship. God is here. We, your people, need to offer praise and prayer. May we find in fuller measures what is it in Christ we share. Let us pray. Holy God, you have commanded us to not be afraid and assured us of your presence. In the midst of trials and joys, sorrows and dreams, May we know your presence and rejoice. Grant us courage, O God, to take delight in your spirit in all times and all places. Grant us faith, O God, to see the myriad of ways you give life. Grant us hope, O God, to participate in your work in the world. Grant us love, O God, to welcome, respond, and act with compassion in all we say and do. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. <clears throat>
God privileges us with time and attention. Let us not squander this time, but approach our Redeemer with a humble and honest confession. Please join me in the prayer of confession listed in your bulletin. We confess our discomfort with uncertainty. We confess our desire for personal power and our desperate grasp for control. We confess our need for everything to make sense. And yet, great God of mystery, there is so much beyond us and our understanding. Remind us we are human. Humble us in your presence. Help us rest in the faith that your grace is sufficient. Amen. God's grace is given freely. God's love is steadfast. Be assured, in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Praise the Lord and bless God's holy name forever. Please stand for the passing of the peace. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The, priest, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Peace.
We now have time with our young disciples if they'd like to come forward. Do you know what holiday is coming up pretty soon? Thanksgiving. Right. But guess what? It doesn't have to be Thanksgiving for us to be thankful. We can be thankful any time we want. I'm going to read to you a story. It's about Psalm 23 in the Bible. In Psalms, it's a long, long book of the Bible. But a lot of the Psalms were written to thank God. Some of them you could sing, some of them were sung, and some of them we just say. So if you don't mind, I'll read this one to you. There's the first page. We all live in different kinds of houses. This is an example of some. It starts out, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, sometimes you might say a prayer before you go to bed or a prayer when you wake up, but whenever you say a prayer, it's nice to be thankful to God. So this is one way of doing it. I shall not be in want. We are very lucky. We usually get whatever we need. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Now that doesn't mean you have to sleep in the pasture all the time. Most of us have a bed. I've seen this story before. Have you really? Okay. And this is kind of like nowadays. We have beautiful leaves falling, except we got some snow. I'm originally from Wisconsin and we have lots of snow. Okay. He leads me beside quiet waters. Have you ever been beside a stream or a lake or an ocean? Have you really? So some of them are kind of like a, a stream would be a small, like little rippling stream. Oceans can be huge. But he leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. That's another reason to thank God. If you're having a really rough time and you're praying and praying and praying and you don't know the answer for your problem, sometimes if you pray quietly and listen, God will show you the way. He restores my soul. Sometimes you can be very, very grateful and thankful for friends, whether they're at school or at home for your family. I'm very lucky I'm from a large family and my brother is here visiting today. I'm so happy to see him. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Do you have any idea what that might mean? Righteousness means the best way to be a Christian for his name's sake, in, in Jesus' name. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, scary times sometimes, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Who is the you that they're talking about? God. Right. You are right on. God is always with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know what a rod and staff is? It could be like, this pole here. But it also means sometimes people think of Jesus as a shepherd, and a shepherd would have a tall rod with a crook on the end of it to gather any sheep that are running away. Yes, absolutely. You're getting this, girl. See, here they are helping an old man walk, and he's got a cane too. So maybe that cane is helping him walk, and it's comforting.
You prepare a table before me. Oh boy, we're looking forward to Thanksgiving dinner. That's special. But we have all of that abundance because God is good to us. In the presence of my enemies, what might be a good idea if you see a bunch of people that are hungry? Give them food. That's why we collect in a basket right by the front door. We collect cans of food and cereal and stuff like that to share. You anoint my head with oil. Do you know what that means? Um, soap. Well, it, it could be soap, yeah. Um, water, yes. And if we baptize a child or a baby up here, usually the minister uses a little bit of drops of water on the baby's head to bless him. The two of you had that done. So instead of oil, sometimes it could be water, just like you said. But it means you're a blessed child of God. Surely, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Aren't we lucky? And, here's the good part. I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Any idea what the last word is? forever. So you can look at this church as the house of the Lord, but guess what? The Lord is with us everywhere, whether we're taking a walk in the woods or in your house or in God's house. He's with us forever. Would you say a prayer with me? Dear God, thank you so much that, that all we have to do is look around and see your gifts to us. Help us share them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, ladies. Now help yourselves to some pictures and cream. Thank you, Sue. Please join me in prayer. Open us, Holy One, to your word and your way. Clear our minds of daily distractions. Fill our hearts with the humility we need to hear and receive the message you intend for us today. Amen. The first lesson today is Psalm 98. Please listen for God's word to you. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered the steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it, let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. And the second lesson today is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 and 13 through 17. As to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we beg you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as though from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord is already here. 
Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the lawless one is revealed, the one destined for destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. Do you not remember that I told you these things when I was still with you? But we must always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. For this purpose, he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, our Father, who loved us and through grace gave us eternal comfort and good hope, comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. Thank you, Lori. If you'll in, indulge me a moment before the reading of the gospel lesson, I, I wonder if you ever pay attention to and, and did you notice this morning's uh, sermon title? Will the circle be unbroken? You know the tune, I presume. Um, but I thought maybe just to freshen it for us, it might be good to play through the tune um, for a moment. But it's not going to be fair to ask uh, Kim to step up um, extemporaneously and do that. So I am prepared to do that for us this morning. <laughs> be CDs in the lobby after the service and my road show starts next week. <laughs> Thank you for allowing that. Um, so you know the tune. Do you know truly what the, what the song is about? It's a song about death. Um, a man has uh, lost uh, his mother, his mother has passed, and he's wondering as he's watching the hearse pull away with her body, uh, if he will ever again see his mother. And so he asks, will the circle be unbroken? And that's the question before us today, thanks to the Sadducees who approach Jesus with a question of their own. And I'm sure you, you've heard of uh, both the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I don't know if you really know the difference between the two. Uh, they're among the religious sects in Jesus' day. In both groups, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees honored Moses <clears throat> and the law. And they both had a measure of uh, political power. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees did not. Because the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, they were sad, you see. <laughs> and in this morning's gospel lesson, the Sadducees approached Jesus with a question. And our gospel reading is found in the 20th chapter of Luke, verses 27 through 38. Through these words, may we hear the word of the Lord to and for us. 
Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married a woman and died childless. Then the second and the third married her. And so in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is God not of the dead, but of the living. For to him all of them are alive. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, it's, it's not every day that uh, the Bible makes a grown man cry. But I remember one day that it did. And it was today's gospel reading that did it. One of my parishioners had asked me to go see her father, begged me really, because his wife had died the year before, and the only thing that had kept him going since then was the idea that someday he would be with her again in heaven. And then somebody told him that wasn't true had used this passage from Luke 20 to prove that it wasn't true because right there in verse 35, Jesus said, those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. And so you won't be married in heaven, the person told him. You might as well just get over that. So I grabbed my Bible, went to see him, he was on his way out the door to pick his grandson uh, up from elementary school. Fine, I said, I'll, I'll just go with you. And it was there in his car while we were waiting in the uh, drive through pickup line at the school that he broke down and cried. And he was a big, strong man. I hated to see it. And so I did what I could to reassure him. I took another look at this passage, and in chapter 20, Luke tells us that the Sadducees, who you know don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, came to Jesus asking this unusual question. They may have been trying to trip him up, or they may have just been trying to settle a long-running argument with the Pharisees, who you know did believe in the resurrection. At any rate, they began with what must have been their standard proof text on the subject. Moses' teaching about marriage from Deuteronomy 25. Let me quote directly from the source. When brothers reside together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her, taking her in marriage, and performing the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the firstborn whom she bears shall succeed to the name of the deceased brother, so that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. I don't remember at what age I first read that passage, but I was quite young and living at home with my three brothers. And I began to imagine how such a thing could really take place. How my brother Steve, for instance, could marry a girl and die before they had children, and how my brother David might have to step in 
and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And then I thought, well, what if David died too? And it was my turn to perform the duty. How would that be? And that's when I began to be very careful about who I let my older brothers date. <laughs> now, there were seven brothers the Sadducees began. The first married and died childless, and then the second, and likewise the third. And so in the same way, all seven died childless, and finally the woman died too. In the resurrection of the dead, therefore, whose wife will she be? For the seven had married her. And you have to admit, it does pose a problem. And not just in extraordinary cases like this one. There are plenty of ordinary cases in which a woman remarries after the death of her husband, or a man remarries after the death of his wife. And sometimes I see tombstones that were purchased when the grief was still fresh, when the widow couldn't imagine ever loving another man. There is her husband's name with his birth and death dates, and there's her name with her birth date carved in stone and a blank space where the other date will go. Sometimes those tombstones say things like, together forever. But the years go by, she meets a nice man and decides to get married again. And then what? In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? And that's where Jesus offers the Sadducees this troubling answer. Those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Now, I sat in there in that man's car for what felt like a long time studying that passage. And finally, I said, look, it doesn't say that you won't be married in heaven. It says that in the resurrection, people don't get married, see? They neither marry, present tense, nor are given in marriage. It's another way of saying there are no weddings in heaven. And that seemed to help him. But I made the mistake of reading on to find out why there aren't any weddings in heaven. And the reason Jesus gives is because there won't be any death there as if the only reason to get married were to make babies, to replenish the population, and thus ensure the uh, survival of the species. I don't know if that's why you got married, but when I got married, the survival of the species was not really the first thing on my mind. I had love on my mind, as I think most of us do these days. But if you read uh, closely, you will find that's not really the biblical view of marriage. Marriage in the Bible seems to be little more than a stable social structure in which children can be born and reared. So when we talk about marriage in America these days, we had better be careful not to embrace too quickly the biblical model of marriage in the same way we want to be careful not to embrace biblical family values. When people begin to talk to me about those values, I say, which biblical family did you have in mind? Cain and Abel, Lot and his daughters, Jacob and Esau, David and Absalom. Those biblical families had some terribly twisted values. And when it comes to marriage, it's true that if marriage is all about making babies, then yes, it would have to be marriage between men and women. We are human beings, after all. We reproduce sexually. But it wouldn't necessarily have to be marriage between one man and one woman, as people like to say. If making babies is the point, then, the more wives you have, the more effective your efforts. Look at Jacob. He produced 12 sons and at least one daughter through his two wives and their two maidservants. Solomon, 
who set some kind of record, practice nation building the old fashioned way. He had 300 wives and 700 concubine, give or take one or two. The problem comes for the Sadducees when they try to imagine one wife with seven husbands rather than the other way around. If wives were considered property, which they were, whose property would she be? The seven would be fighting over her in the resurrection, making the whole notion seem ridiculous. And that's just what the Sadducees wanted to do. They wanted to make the whole notion of resurrection seem ridiculous. But Jesus sees things another way. They don't marry there, he says. Neither are they given in marriage because there isn't any death there. Remember that child's letter to God that says, Dear God, instead of letting people die and having to make new ones, why don't you just keep the ones you got now? And in the resurrection, that's just what God does. He keeps the ones he's got. And so there isn't any need for a social structure in which children can be born and reared just so the species can be preserved. And there isn't any need to have children so you can secure your social status or achieve some small measure of immortality. And I'm going to bet my bottom dollar that those women who are considered worthy of the resurrection are not going to be treated as anyone's property ever again. Things are different there. Thank God. And resurrection is real. Jesus proves it to the Sadducees by referring to a story from Exodus, one of the few books in the Bible they accepted as authoritative. It was that story from Exodus 3, the one about the burning bush, where God identifies himself to Moses as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He doesn't say he was their God. He says he is right now, for he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You want to know if there is a resurrection? Jesus asks, take that. It's a good answer. At least it works for them. In the very next uh, verse, uh, the scribes who were listening burst into applause. And after that, no one dared ask Jesus any more questions. But I've got one. I accept the fact of the resurrection, but what about reunion? Will the circle be unbroken? Will that man who wept in his car that day be reunited with his wife? And in what way? Will they have a little cottage right there beside some golden street in heaven where they can sit on the front porch in their rocking chairs as they hold hands and watch the sun set over the crystal sea? And if so, what about the second wife that same man later married? Where will she sit? And whose hand will she hold? As far as reunion goes, I'm sure of it not only from this passage in which Jesus speaks of the eternal family reunion of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but also in that passage from John 14, where he tells the disciples that he's going to prepare a place for them so that where he is, there they may be also. If that's not reunion, I don't know what is. And as far as the kind of relationship we might enjoy in that place, is it possible that the most loving and intimate relationships we have known in this life are but a taste of the relationships we will enjoy in the life to come? I can imagine that man seeing his first wife in heaven and embracing her with tears in his eyes and telling her how much he missed her and how glad he is to see her again. 
I can imagine that all the best memories of the life they lived together would be fresh and new for him there. But I can also imagine him introducing her to his second wife without any fear that she would be jealous or angry. All that small and fearful, greedy and grasping love would be gone, replaced by the kind of love God has for us, abundant as the ocean and just as full of grace. Maybe the two of them would go strolling off hand in hand, those two wives, while he stayed behind, shaking his head with wonder. Who knows? Only God. The best we can do is speculate. But we, know, we can know this much at least. Thanks to Jesus, that resurrection is real, that reunion is real, that in that resurrection reunion, things really will be different. The circle will be unbroken. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip us with everything good for doing his will and work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Our faith affirmation statement this morning comes from one of our uh, confessions, the Confession of 1967. I invite you uh, in body or in spirit to stand that we may uh, recite this together. The life, death, resurrection, and promise coming of Jesus Christ has set the pattern for the church's mission. His life as man involves the church in the common life of men. His service to men commits the church to work for every form of human well-being. His suffering makes the church sensitive to all the sufferings of mankind so that it sees the face of Christ in the faces of men in every kind of need. His crucifixion discloses to the church God's judgment on man's humanity, to man and the awful consequences of its own complicity in injustice. In the power of the risen Christ and the hope of his coming, the church sees the promise of God's renewal of man's life in society and of God's victory over all wrong.
may be seated. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Holy God, your loving kindness knows no ending. Out of the depths of slavery, you heard the cry of your people and responded with liberation. Hear us from the depths of our captivity. For your people held captive by addictions that ravage body, mind, and spirit. We affirm your spirit abides among us. We will not fear. For your people held captive by violence, abuse, and exploitation. We attest your spirit abides among us. We will not fear. For your people held captive by illness, weakness, and vulnerability, we recall your spirit abides among us, and we will not fear. For your people held captive by economic or vocational poverty, we proclaim your spirit abides among us, we will not fear. Holy God, your loving kindness knows no ending. Hear our prayers and keep us faithful until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. We have freely received God's marvelous grace through Jesus Christ. Let us respond with generosity.
Please join me in prayer. Holy God, how often we take for granted all that we have. How often we fail to recognize how blessed we are. Take these gifts we give in response to your generosity and use them to further Christ's mission and ministry in a hurting world. Amen. leave this house of worship today redeemed by grace renewed in faith and restored to hope may god the creator redeemer and sustainer bless us and keep us as we leave to love and serve <laughs>